Uh, today we continue our study in the life of Elijah. Uh, I chose to do a series of studies. I think I wrote down this is our 17th one in the life of Elijah. We're just covering one portion of his life. And that's the portion of his life involved with King Ahab. This is the North Kingdom. Um, and the King Ahab was the eighth king of the North Kingdom. You know, they divided after David's death into North and South. And uh, Ahab was the eighth king. And uh, he followed the tradition of the other seven kings. That he was an evil king. Um, and he had a great opportunity in his life to change all that, like most of us. God is great in his marvelous grace to give us an opportunity to do positive things, uh, and he chose not to do them. You know, it is, it is choices we make, isn't it? Uh, choices in our life sometimes are short, of short durations, and sometimes they're a long duration, sometimes a lifetime our choices we make. That's why it's important to make them according to the will of God. To the best of your ability through the study of the word of God, you make choices. Uh, we have volition. We have free will to, to make good choices. And uh, sometimes the earlier mistakes we make really help us make good choices later, don't they? Uh, not true in the life of Ahab so well. And the reason was he had bought into the evil of the world rather than the divine viewpoint of God. Uh, we have a great deal of that going on in America today. But anyhow, we're in the 19th chapter. We've come off from Mount Carmel. There, there was a great contest because Ahab married a foreign bride. That's not necessarily bad, but she was evil in herself. She came out of the Baal worship culture of the Phalic cult. And um, when she married a, a political marriage, apparently, married Ahab, when she came to the nation, she brought her, her religion with her. The problem is she wanted it to be the only religion. And uh, so what she did is convinced her husband to be kind of generous to her as a young bride. And he was. And so she murdered all of the prophets of God and established a state religion of the Baal worship. However, there was in the government Obadiah. He was well connected to the people and he served Obadiah as his right-hand advisor. Uh, Obadiah served Ahab, King Ahab, as an advisor. And he put his, much like Esther, he, he put his neck out in a noose because he rescued a hundred of the prophets from her murderous plot and hid them. What's interesting about that story of course, that's a marvelous thing, is the marvelous grace of God. But out of that hundred, apparently, came a guy called Elijah. And out of that hundred, later in life, Elijah, later in the story, Elijah is going to, in fact, in our probably next week, Elijah is going to feel like he's all alone, that there's no other prophet, there's no other voice of God. And every time he raises his voice, the government tries to shut it down. And um, he's going to have an experience with God when he, he's complaining about being alone. You know, as a believer, you're never alone, are you? No, because God promises you he'll never leave nor forsake you. <laughs> so how could you ever be alone when he promises that he will never leave you nor forsake you in Hebrews 13th chapter? But he, he's got caught up in fear and, and the world's way of thinking and has lost a basic principle that God never leaves you. 
You belong to the family of God through Christ. When, when, when you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you belong to him. You're, in the church age, you're part of the royal family of God. You're, in, you're connected to the royalty of the throne of David through Christ under the new covenant. This is a wonderful thing. But anyhow, so you see, this is a story. So he gets really down in the dumps about his life, doesn't think he's been fairly treated by God and other people. And other people, truly, other people hadn't treated him well, but God always does. It's part of his character. He cannot go against his own character. He wouldn't be God. And so, you know, he doesn't recall what you should recall and I should recall when we go through those stormy periods in our life that God never leaves you nor forsake you and everything he deals with your life over as a child of God is good for you. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God. See, those are important times when you go through difficult times and stormy periods in your life to remember those basic principles of doctrine that are connecting your character with the character of God. And so he gets down in the dumps and, and uh, begins to proclaim to, God, pro proclaim to God that he's all alone and he wonders even if God has forsaken him. And God tells him there's 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal. Where did the 7,000 come from? Do you not ask yourself a question like that? She's killed all but 100, and 100 have been in hiding. Pretty active 100 people, weren't they? Pretty active 100 people. Pretty active 100 people. <laughs> A good reminder to us, I chose, I chose the life of Elijah in this specific period of his life because I think there's a lot to be related to in our lives during the COVID crisis, personally. So I hope to bring some of that out to you today as I have been through all of my studies. So we've had this great victory at Mark Carmel with 880 prophets again against one Elijah. And uh, he, he prays this wonderful prayer as a praying guy, speaks the truth of the word of God to God in prayer and God answers it with fire and the, the contest was over and it was a contest winner take all. You know, we talked about that same idea when Goliath come out and boasted, I can, I, you know, where's your God? You, I don't see it in your people. And, uh, you know, let's have a contest, winner take all. And uh, uh, little David shows up <laughs> and uh, put an end to that whole idea. You know, the enemy always tells you winner take all. And then when, it, when, the, when the top guy falls, it's not winner, it's everybody for themselves. That's kind of interesting. But anyhow, there's where our story is. And so we come today because off this great victory, Elijah had two great victories on Mount Carmel. Remember, he had two victories. One was fire from heaven that burnt the offering and, and won the contest. Uh, remember, they prayed all day to their gods and got nothing. They, they shed their blood and got nothing. Elijah prayed a simple prayer to God according to his word. He answers your prayers according to his, you know, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. He answers prayer according to his will. Don't answer it just, and I'm going to talk about that today with his prayer. But, you know, if you want prayers answered, you've got to pray according to his will, and his will comes from his word. Uh, you know, it's a, you have to become a student of the word of God if you want to have effective prayer life. And who doesn't want an effective prayer life? Uh, Jonah didn't think it was important until he was inside the belly of the whale. <laughs> Boy, did he learn prayer. Huh? He became a praying warrior. Uh, well, I guess we all. You know, God, isn't he wonderful? He'll, he just wants you to be in tune with him. You got too much static down here, and he just wants to tune you up a little bit. And uh, that's good for all of us. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and I'll get into my morning study, which is entitled... Elijah is his worst enemy. Now, he thinks it's Jezebel. But the truth of the matter, it was him. He's his worst enemy. 
The worst thing that can happen in your life as a believer is become your worst enemy. And I meet a lot of people who are their worst enemies. I meet a lot of them. So let's pray. Well, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality of the flesh, carnal way of thinking, back into the divine plan of God? I confess my sin. You have the right because you are a priest under the priesthood of Jesus Christ, according to 1 Peter 2. And you have that right under the new covenant. And it's a responsibility you have to your priesthood, your personal priesthood with the Lord. He says, if we confess our sins, homo legeo means to confess it, means to name it, cite it, be in agreement with God that that's sin the Bible tells you what sin is. People don't. God does. And when it's declared sin, you have to confess it to get out of carnality and into spirituality, to get out of the flesh and the carnal way of thinking worldly and back into the plan of God. The key word in 1 John 1, 9 to me, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse that word cleanse goes back to verse 7, and it goes back to the cross of Jesus Christ, who works on behalf of the, the blood of Christ, works on behalf of the Christian. When we confess our sins, his blood cleanses the Christian, restores him to spirituality. When an unbeliever, when an unbeliever believes the gospel that Christ died for his sin, Adamic sin, was buried and raised from the dead, he gets saved from Adamic sin. The 13 judicials are of Adamic sin, like spiritual death and spiritual blindness and such as that. So I'm, I'm thankful, Father, that you've given a, a, a way as believers can come back into the relationship with you uh, where we're able to live that life according to your structured plan in the Word of God. We pray that today as we confess our sins in silence and privacy through our priesthood, through the priesthood of Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that confession. It can be made anywhere, at any time, in any circumstance. And I'm thankful for that. Encourage our hearts today through the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he teaches his truth from the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to show you something on your paper. I'm one, two, three, four, about four paragraphs down. We learn that Elijah is running what he said, I'm running for my life. But in running for his life, as we read the scriptures, he's running away from God. I don't know. You probably meet people over your lifetime who are running away from something in their life bad experience, bad marriage, bad business deal, bad, bad, bad. But if you're running from something, you're probably running from a solution to your spiritual problem. What you should, he should be running for is God. He shouldn't be running for his life. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Elijah, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Abraham believed the same thing that you believe. Galatians 3.8, how was Abraham saved? He was saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back then called Christ. We didn't know what his, what his incarnate, incarnation uh, title was his, to his humanity. We'll call him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. We, we knew that theologically, but they called him Christ in the Old Testament. We call him Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And you should properly call him Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But I mean, here, is, here, here is the point. He's running for his life, but he's running away from God. 
what he's running from is Jezebel, who has, put, who has threatened him. It's an empty threat. She's, she hasn't sent anybody after him. She just sent a message, says, I'm going to get you before tomorrow. When 24 hours are up, you're going to be as dead as my prophets. I paraphrased it. You can read about it. So he took a run in. If he'd have done that at Mount Carmel, we'd have lost. And so the Bible says, the Bible describes him as running for his life. You can't run for your life successfully and run from God. I mean, at some point, you got to stop doing that. There is no, there's not going to be a happy place for you to find, and, and you're going to find it in his life. He's running from God. He, he, runs, he runs to Beersheba, and then he runs to the wilderness. And, 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 and once you start running, where are you going to stop? I mean, you're on a fast track going nowhere. I called last time we preached on this. We said Elijah was running when no one was chasing him. I mean, you know what that is? That's fear. That's, that's the worst kind of fear. <clears throat> that's uh, when I was a kid, we used to call it being afraid of your own shadow. If you go back that far. <clears throat> yeah. So Elijah's running for his, from his life. Rather than stop, stand firm, and fight the good fight of faith, he chose, he chose to run. He chose to run. <clears throat> and he's not even playing good defense. Apparently, he didn't watch the ball game last night. <laughs> or at least he didn't watch the second half. <clears throat> so, in 1 Timothy 6, 12 on your paper, just the scripture, you're supposed to stand firm and fight the good fight of faith. You know, you, when you compare you know, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith, then, you, you know, you always, you always put with it Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, which tells you to put the full armor of God on to fight. You know, one of the songs I really liked when I first came to Christianity 100 year, years ago, you know, I, I used to say that, and I'm closer than I... <laughs> at some point, I'm going to have to stop saying that because I'm going to be there. <laughs> but I used to say, I'd say that, you know, jokingly, uh, but uh, it's uh, closer than it was yesterday, I can tell you that. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> I don't know where I was going with that. It had not matter. Uh, the put on the full armor of God. Now, I want to connect a couple of things with you. I want to. I, I want you. I want to. I want you to do something with me. Yeah, are you on that paragraph with me on your study guide? Yeah, First Timothy. Thing. Well, I want to show you something, and then we're going to go to First Peter. So I want you to do something with me. I want you to go two places with me. First, let's go to Luke. I want to show you something really. How God is faithful to us. How wonderful God is. He's so faithful. I mean, we, you know. We thumb our nose at him. Uh, we, we do all kinds of things, and, and God is so patient with us. That, that's what's interesting to me. God is so patient with us. You know, he sees something in us we can't see in ourselves, and nobody could possibly see us. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're like a, a, a diamond in the rough or whatever. And, and so I'm in, I'm in Luke. I'm in Luke. If you go to Luke with me, I'm in Luke 22. That, for, for a lot of us, Luke 22 deals with the Last Supper. And I want to go uh, at the Last Supper. This is the Last Supper of Christ. And I, I want to go down into verses 31 and 32. When it gets into discussion at the Last Supper um, with Peter, and I want to show you something that's really important. And I want, I want you to see the faithfulness of God to your life today. God, I mean, sometimes everybody else gives up on us. People go like, well, I don't know what's happened to them. Where are they gone? And what are they doing? And all that. But look, 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 they ain't going anywhere. God don't know where they are. They've gone someplace I don't know where they are. They ain't going anywhere where God don't know where they are. And God is so faithful to them. I mean, look how faithful he was to Jonah. Even in the stomach of a large sea monster at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, man. But here we are in verse 31, 30. Yeah, I just want you to see how God, faithful God is in the midst of all of our failures and mistakes, our bad choices. And listen to what he says to Simon Peter at the Last Supper on his way to the cross. 
He says, Simon, Simon. Now, Peter should have known he was in trouble. <laughs> right? Boy, I knew. When I heard my mother say, Ronaldian Adama, I knew I was in deep stuff. I never got that name. I was usually Ronnie. But when it came Ronald Leon, buddy, I'd look at my buddies and say, man, I got to get home. I'm in trouble. So he, he says, Simon, Simon. That's, he's talking to Peter now. And he's using his natural man name. He's talking, he's, he's talking to the flesh of Simon. <laughs> he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. If you want to know that subject, you have to go to Job 1 and 2. We're not. But if you'd like to know what it means to be permission, Satan got permission to sift a believer like wheat. Now, I'm a farm boy. I understand sifting uh, wheat, you know, trying to, get, trying to separate the shaft from the, from the grain. They, there's always, when God's doing it, he's trying to get to the grain, ain't he? Oh, come on now, come on now. Come on, Simon. Sift you like wheat. Now, if you want, like, if you want to study that, you go to Job 1 and 2. Watch the butt. Uh, Larry Tidwell hit it pretty good the other day, didn't he? <laughs> I love that. All those butts get you in trouble. He said, I'm not talking about a B-U-B-B. I'm talking about B-U-B-B. But anyhow, but I have prayed for you. He said, I have. I, I, he didn't say, and I'm going to start praying for you. <laughs> I've been praying for you, Bubba. I, I don't know if he called him Bubba. <laughs> but I have prayed for you. But he is acting like a Bubba, and he? Uh, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I've met a couple Bubbas, but I don't know. But I have prayed for you. Now watch this. Watch the that. I'm, I'm going to show it used twice. You can only see it once that your faith may not fail. What's he praying for? That his faith not fail. Right? See, that's that faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, believing, applying, and completing. Your faith could fail any, any of that. That thing has to cycle around. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Then you got to believe it. Then it becomes part of your belief system. Then you got to apply it because that's part of your life system. Then you got to complete it. That's part of the divine plan. Oh, yeah. Aren't you glad you came today? I'm going to change your life forever. Change your way you think, I hope. That your faith may not fail. See, your faith could fail. How could, it, how could my faith fail? You're not exercising, not run it, not do the faith cycle. That's how it fails. It don't fail because you haven't exercised. It fails because you have it and don't exercise it. Don't use it. Don't use it. How, where does faith come from? Come, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. What do you have to do? You have to believe it. Then you have to exercise it. You have to apply it to your life. <clears throat> you know what he called it in 2 Corinthians 5, 7? He called it walking by faith. Walk it. The ap application side is walking it out in your life. Applying it in your life. And you, now watch this. He's going to give another that. It's, it's not there, but you'll see it. And you, when once you have turned again, returned, that's the idea. When, then strengthen your brethren. Your brethren. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to pray for you, he says. I am praying for you. I have been praying for you. <laughs> Girl, you got trouble with your faith system in your life. You have a problem. You have the problem, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, here's the problem. You either walk by either. It's either or. You either walk by faith or you walk by sight. You either, Galatians 5, 16, you either walk in the spirit indwelling in the Holy Spirit, or you walk in the flesh, the natural man, the way of the world. Okay? Flesh and sight go together, right? Yes. 
So he says, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren, right? Now, Jesus is going to say goodbye to Peter, and he's going to go to the cross. Listen to what Peter writes. Go to 1 Peter with me. Peter writes about this. In 1 Peter, Hebrews, James, Peter, Peter, Peter 5, I, I, it's, it's 6 through 10, but listen, when it gets time to go home, I'm just going to shut down and go home anyhow, okay? I'll never get through all this, so. By now, you know that, so. <laughs> when it comes time, though, we're going to go home. Listen to what he says. And this, this, was, this was, was Peter's problem. It was also Paul's problem. He was given a thorn of thass, thorn in the flesh, to keep him from exalting himself. What God wanted was humility, genuine humility, not this, not this smoky glass window <laughs> humility, you know. I mean, the real stuff where you're grace-oriented in it. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Well, look at verse 5 for a minute. That, that's where the humble comes to. God is opposed to the proud, the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself. See? God is opposed to the proud. Elijah's going to learn it. Peter had to learn it. We all have to learn it. God's opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. You, you, you want to be a grace-oriented person? Then you better learn to be humble. Humble. You know, the meek, the humble. Now, I'm not talking about the way the world identifies. I'm talking about the way God identifies. That's a person who stays grace-oriented with God's plan no matter what storms come and go in his life. God's opposed God opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble, therefore, hu there, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That's where the humble lives. The humble lives under the mighty hand of God, right? <laughs> that's the tent. Come on, Baba. Therefore, under the humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. See, that's what Elijah is not doing because he's running from it. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Watch this now. Your adversary, the devil, boy, who knows that better than him, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's his goal. But resist him. Watch this now. Firm in your faith knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Didn't Jesus tell him that? Isn't he doing it? And he's learned to be humble in doing it. He's gone through God taking out his arrogance towards the plan of God and bringing him to a place of submission to the will of God. That's humble. You're not humble if you're always opposing the will of God in your life. You're proud. You're arrogant. And you better to you're better off dealing with it yourself volitionally and graciously. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Isn't that marvelous? That's what Peter's learned. That's what Peter's learned since Luke 22, 31, 32. That's his life journey. That's been his life journey. Has it been yours? That was his. God trying to, to, to tear out the arrogance that's in opposition to the plan of God in your daily choices to get down where you will live under the tent of humility because God gives grace to the whom? Just remember that. And he's always trying to get you into the humility of your life in God 
where you, you understand it's his mighty hand that always supports you when you make choices based on the word of God. Okay? Humbled under the mighty hand of God is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. He's allowing the, the, the sifting of the wheat to bring out the, the, the to bring out the, uh, br to take out the, 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 the arrogance or the proud and, and to put in the grace humility. Say, I'm going through it. And this is important for me. It's important for me to run to God. It's important for me to understand what God is doing in my life and to be content with the choices at this point in my life that I can't do anything about anyhow. And what is the purpose that God has in a guy who is already grace-oriented? He's dealing with this getting the purity of the humility out of my life. You understand? It's a sifting, and it's okay. It can be painful. It's okay. Let him do that. Bring yourself under the mighty hand of God. It's okay to cry through the journey. It's okay to struggle through it. It's just, but stay under the mighty hand of God. Because what he's trying to do is to bring a, a better message out of your life to the people you minister to. You see, he did it with Peter. He did it with Peter, and Peter went through the mill, didn't he? You think of the sifting that he went through into the Niles of Christ. And when Christ came out, chained to go to the cross, Peter wept bitterly, the Bible says. You know, that, that's an agony in the soul, isn't it? To weep bitterly is a bad place to be in your life. Do you know that? When the hand of God has, has moved you to that place. And you weep bitterly. That's not a good thing. It's okay to weep. Don't weep bitterly. He, he had a whole sense of failure in his life. He had a whole, uh, it was like inside he just caved in. And he didn't have to. Why aren't, you, aren't you glad that Christ is always praying on your behalf? <laughs> aren't you thankful for that? And aren't you thankful for some people that lay you before the throne every day of your life and you don't even know it? My wife had a wonderful ministry doing that with people. My wife had a wonderful ministry doing that. A lot of the people sitting here, most of the people sitting here was on her prayer list every day just to keep them steadfast Hold them, Father. Hold them. Hold them to your calling. Hold them to your calling. Let me talk about a few things before my time is up. Let me talk about a few more things. <laughs> I have three things on your paper. I'll probably never get to them. John usually, when it's time for me to go, he sticks a, a white flag out and waves it. <laughs> That's how I know when it's time to go. Uh, point number one, I want to begin why, with a key doctrinal principle. I, I don't want you to miss this doctrinal principle for a spiritually advancing believer because this, this could be um, an Achilles kill, heel, or kill, however it might, might be. Listen to this. Listen to this doctrine because this is in the life of Elijah. A spiritually advancing believer is most vulnerable Watch this now. After a great spiritual victory, the angelic conflict, because Satan is sure to launch a counterattack on you. He did with, boy, I mean, the ink, the ink wasn't dry on the paper that says Elijah scored a magnificent victory for, 
before he was running for his life. <laughs> Rather than fighting for the cause of God. So I want you to get that because Elijah came off of two great miracles. The rain, which removed the three and a half years of drought. And the fire. Uh, those two great victories. Spiritual guilt. Spiritual guilt of failure. Like Peter. Was what Elijah faced. Once Elijah, listen to me, this is really important. What got Elijah after great victory? Once Elijah used violence to solve a spiritual problem, you know what Elijah did after he won a great victory? He had all the 850 prophets killed. You know why that whole contest was? To bring a spiritual awakening for a spiritual reformation of the nation. He used, he used physical violence to solve a spiritual problem. Let me tell you, that never works. It don't work in your marriage. It don't work in your family. It don't work in your church. It doesn't work anywhere successfully. He did it, and that's, that's a sad day. Elijah became susceptible and vulnerable to violence even by an empty threat. Uh, given by Jezebel. Peter did it in the garden of Gethsemane on the way to the cross. When they came to arrest Jesus, he boastfully had told them earlier, yeah, I'm willing to die with you. Yeah, Peter, but you're not willing to live for me. See, it's easy to die for somebody and not live for him. Well, I, I don't know. I'm... <laughs> I'm thinking that Peter must have had that in his mind somewhere. He told Peter, Peter grabs his sword, you know, and he takes a swing at a guy and cuts off an ear. Jesus has to put it back on so the man could hear what Jesus had to say, I suppose. I don't know why you would do that. Put your sword back into its place for all those who take up the sword shall perish by it. Hey, this is spiritual war, Peter. This is not physical war. This is spiritual war. You haven't been listening to me. I told you I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. Three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. You haven't been listening to it. He's been telling Peter that since Matthew 16. Do what? All right, probably. But Peter cut off one ear, but he had shed to both of his. I mean, how does that work? Well, anyhow, Jesus tells Peter that, see? He's talking to Peter about that. See, Elijah, Elijah should know the same, same biblical principle. You can't solve spiritual problems with physical force. You can't do it in your marriage. You, you, can't, you can't do it in your family. It, it's not discipline when it's violent. In Matthew 26.50, I, I just quoted Matthew 26.52. In 26.54, he went on to say to Peter, how then shall the scripture be fulfilled? See, it's a spiritual problem. A spiritual problem, listen, a spiritual problem in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your life, requires a, biblical, a scriptural answer. But this is Jesus himself. I mean, he's still teaching in the midst of all this mess, right? He's still teaching. Wow. How then shall the scripture be fulfilled? How was it going to be fulfilled in your life? You got to put the faith cycle. You, you got to hear it. You got to believe it. You got to apply it. You got to complete it. It's, it's got to cycle through your life. It's not a just to hear it. You got to believe it. It's not just enough to believe it. You got to live it. It's not just enough to live it. You, you've got to bring it as a gift to God. Where he says to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You, that's the whole purpose of the faith cycle. 
And God gives you a nod. This is what I've been praying for in your life. This is what I've been engaged with in your life. It, listen, it's, I'm not telling you this as just a pastor. I'm telling you this as a, as a believer in Christ. This is how it works. It works in my life that way. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I've got the pulpit today. This is a, a life learning experience. You got to get it. Elijah knew that the victory at Mark Carmel was not completed until God sent the rain. Or the rain was a part of moving Israel to a spiritual awakening at Mount Carmel so that there could be a spiritual reformation to remove idolatry that had, had replaced God with paganism of idolatry. I mean, Mount Carmel wasn't the complete, it was the beginning of a great, to be a great victory for God. We're going to win it at Carmel. Listen, it, it bothers me. And I've, to, I've told you that it bothers me that he killed all these prophets. No telling how many Pauls were connected to all of those, right? I mean, you can't do that. Whew. You can't. I mean, these people, if they're not born again, where are they going when they die? You kill them all, where are they going? Well, I hope they're going where I sent them. What kind of an attitude is that for a man who is supposed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? You should be a servant of the living. I don't know. It bothers me, as you can see. Let me give you a point, too. And John ain't put the flag out yet, so I'm good for point, two. Elijah became vulnerable to Jezebel's empty threat of violence. He ran when no one was chasing him, just an empty threat. I, I, we talked at great lengths about that. Everything she declared she would do to him and had the power to do it, she had none of it. She had none of it. And, he knew, and nobody should have known that better than him. But, uh, yeah. Or you. Right? You know what that is? Listen to me. I, I, want, you to put, I want you to write SIM down. I want you to write S-I-M on your paper. SIM. Yeah, self-induced misery. The worst enemy that you could ever engage with in your life with, is yourself in self-induced misery. That pity party, nobody wants to visit. Do you know what kind of gifts they would bring to a pity party? Huh? Handkerchiefs have been used. Right? Who would go to that party? Somebody that's a, is a pity party goer. That's who would go. I don't know. I wouldn't want to go. So I want you to remind him, because his worst enemy is himself and in self-induced misery. He's brought all this onto himself. He's running. He's weary. He's worn out. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He's miserable. All brought on by bad choices. All done by himself. Yeah, no wonder he's alone. You throw a pity party, probably you're the only one that's got a word of encouragement. That's what I would think. He has made himself emotional, physical, mentally, and spiritually weary by succumbing to Jezebel's empty threat. Elijah has done this to himself. It is called self-induced misery of old man thinking, worldly thinking. I mean, what's the worst thing she could do to him? Kill him? And God would have to sign off on that, which means his time's up. So you want to go anyhow. That day you're going to go? What, 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 what does it matter? You're going to go. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, tells you there's a day to be born that day. I mean, that, they're on every tombstone I've ever seen. Your whole life is just a dash, right? <laughs> Think about that. All these great plans you had, just a dash. All the great achievements you have, just a dash. All the accolades you've ever gotten, just a dash. You know what's important? Your birth and death. Where are you going? I'll tell you, that's what's important when you get my age. Where are you going? Where are you going? And what wonderful confidence it is to be with somebody that knows that and be a part of that journey, even, even through that. 
experience of dying grace. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. Mm. I can't imagine. Oh, write this passage down because it's not in your paper. Write down Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Tells you, listen, the devil is a guy who promotes the fear of death. Christians don't fear death. They welcome it. They don't fear it. Or I, I, I say they shouldn't. They shouldn't. They should read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. As a spiritual advancing believer, Elijah is running for his life, but he's running away from the source of his life, God. How dumb is that? Elijah, what were you thinking? Well, I wasn't. I was just running. Well, yeah. So God has to let him wear himself out. He's, just, he's like the children of Israel, walking around, walking around, walking around with no purpose. See, it's one thing to walk around the, the, chariots, the, the walls of Cherio. Cherios. I should have eaten more before I left the house this morning. Walking around Cheerios, Jericho, there was a purpose in that, right? And at the, at the end, God goes like, da 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 And the walls fall down, and everybody goes, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. The children of wilderness, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years. And what they got? That's what they got. Yeah, nothing. You know why? They walk for nothing. He's running for nothing. You know what he's going to get? <laughs> he's going to get a seat. His, he's going to get a kick in the pants. That's what he's going to get before it's over. He has chosen fright and flight rather than fight and faith. That's a sad day in the life of this wonderful guy. A sad day. So let me tell you what his choices should have been. And I think we'll go home. Does that be all right with you? We'll eat, eat a bowl of Cheerios. <laughs> if you come to my house, I'll give you a bowl of Cheerios. I wouldn't recommend it, though. Let us run. Listen to this. Let us run with endurance the race that's been set before us. How are we going to run it? Endurance. You know what endurance is? I heard it the other day from a granddaughter who ran 13 miles and her knees nearly blew out at 10. But she was only so many seconds behind her husband and still thought she might be able to beat him at the goal at the end. Boy, there's a competitive spirit. You see why she was welcomed into our family? <laughs> yeah, let's see that competitive spirit come out in you, girl. We'll, get, we'll find out how competitive you are. <laughs> wow, I said to her, honey, when your knees blow, don't ever run it. Don't, listen, don't keep running the car on flat tires. Nothing good comes out of that. But we're to run with endurance, and that's that second wind or third wind or through pain, what it might be, endurance. Endurance. What a, what, why would you need endurance? I'll tell you, if you ever run farther than you're supposed to run, <laughs> endurance is a key word. And what you keep looking for is the finish. Right? It could be at work. You go like, I've, I've got, now, I talk to people who've got three years left in education or three years more to retire. That, that, that's all they think about. You have a cup of coffee with them. It will come up every time you have a cup of coffee with them. Yeah, I've got, it came up with me when I became a short-timer in the Army. How, I, I, it, they call you that. They call you a short-timer I, I, or worse. A short timer would be good. Let us run with endurance the race. Watch this. That's set before us. You see, you always run into what where where you something positive. 
Elijah, he don't know where he's running. He's just running, running away from Jezebel, but in doing it, he's running away from God. He's running for his life. What's the source of your life? Well, I ain't got time to think about it. I can't talk right now. I'm running for my life. Well, let's stop and talk about your life. If you're running for your life, what's your life, what's your life goal? What is, what's, what's the deal about it? I can't talk now. She's right. There's nobody following you. There's, there's, there's not even any dust down the trail. I don't see anything. You don't understand. Ain't that the, ain't that the go-to line? You haven't walked in my shoes. And I have to walk in them, you know. Got my own. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's Hebrews, the 12 chapters, uh, one. You should read all three verses. See, he stopped running for God and started running away from him. That's a bad deal. That's a bad deal. Nothing good's going to come out of that deal. Here's a second idea. He said, for consider him who has endured. This is why the word endured is important. Consider the one who endured the hostility of sinners against him. Jesus Christ going to the cross. See, that's at Hebrews 12. that says, set your eyes, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and, f- and finisher of your faith. So that's at Hebrews 12. He says, you run that race of endurance. You run it, you run it for God. God will reward it in great ways, both in the running, in the race, in the rewards. Keep your eyes on Jesus who ran that race before you. Who shows you how to run it. Because the prize at the end is greater than the pain getting there. Boy, is that true. Boy, is that ever true. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, that's what's happened to our man Elijah. Well, point number three is for your study at home. It's a good quiet time study. Go t- takes you back to the passage. Let you take a look at it. I want to thank you for coming today. I'm so thankful for you, your visit and for you guys coming in today with us uh, from Texas. Thanks for being with us. Uh, and especially for the kind words you said about Jane. That, that was wonderful. Remember on your way out, don't leave a check based on what you heard. Just leave a check because of your love for God. <laughs> and that will, do, that will be fine. Remember, this meal has been paid for by the courtesy of God's grace. And, uh, but those of you that know what to do, you do it on your way out. And those who are visiting, just these wonderful people have paid for this, this uh, whole thing. Well, we thank you. Let's have a word of prayer. And then, Rick, you'll uh, take us out of here with a pledge. Well, Father, we're saying, thankful for your marvelous grace. And we're always reminded, Father, to be humbled. That's a good thing. Until it becomes a norm and standard in our life. That what is one of the great goals that God does when he sifts our life for the pure grain, to get the fluff out of our life, is to bring us to a place where he can supply the ultimate of grace to the humble. He doesn't have to deal with the arrogance complex and all of that. So continue, Father, to sift us like wheat. Refine us, Father, into the humility of God's marvelous grace program. Let us be thankful for it. We know you would only do that which is good for us and for the plan of God. I thank you, Father, for all this church has meant to me and my family. We will continue to be that ministry, Father, to these and to all those of our community that have a need for spiritual growth and maturity 
it is our passion, and it is our ministry. Encourage our hearts, Father. Encourage our hearts. We know that Christ prays for us to be strengthened in our faith. And so we leave that prayer with you in Jesus' name. Amen.